test 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 all right Welcome to another Hoopo stream. A uh, little later today, it's a little icy here in Austin. So, one of the first things you're gonna probably notice is that I have a AI filter going on right now. I have NVIDIA broadcast, which means that I have a eye contact filter. So you'll see that as long as I'm kind of vaguely staring at the camera, my eyes will always stare at the camera. So we'll see how it works. Maybe it's a little creepy, but we're gonna try it out. Okay. So the paper we're gonna read today is uh, Moose Eye. I think it's like Music AI is kind of what they were trying to go for here. And this is text to music generation with long context latent diffusion. So it's a diffusion model applied uh, to music. So basically rather than going from text into uh, an image, this is going from text into a uh, audio. This is very fresh. This is uh, just a couple days ago was released. And it actually has a really great uh, PyTorch repo. So this is a GitHub repo. It's got a ton of stars, MIT license, this looks really, really awesome, and I can't wait to use it, but uh, we might actually just save this uh, for until tomorrow, and then uh, today do the actual uh, paper. So we're going to read the paper, and then uh, tomorrow, depending on how the paper comes out and how uh, easy we think it is and how good this technique is, we can go ahead and try out the actual code. So first things... First, let's read this abstract. The recent surge in popularity of diffusion models for image generation has brought new attention to the potential of these models in other areas of, image, of media synthesis. Application of diffusion models to music generation. Music generation requires to handle multiple aspects, including temporal dimension, long-term structure, multiple layers of overlapping sounds, nuances that only trained listeners can detect, yeah, sure, I would say that uh, probably images are harder than audio, but that's also my opinion as someone who deals with mostly images. In our work, we investigate the potential diffusion models for text-conditioned music generation. Uh, they have a cascading latent diffusion approach that can generate multiple minutes of high-quality stereo music at 48 kilohertz. So this is the sampling frequency. So with audio, uh, right at the end of the day, audio is just a wave. It's basically a pressure wave that's going through uh, the medium of uh, usually air, but it, you can travel, sound can travel through uh, hard uh, things as well, including water and then actually like metal, for example. So the, the frequency of the wave that goes through uh, how often are you basically sampling that that wave, and that's the sampling frequency here, so 48,000 times per second. For each model, we make an effort to maintain reasonable inference speed targeting real time on a single customer GPU. Okay, so that's important. Uh, provide a collection of open source libraries with hope of facilitating future work in the field. So the interesting thing here, if you actually look at this, Okay, so these people, these researchers here, Flavio and the uh, advisor here, Scholkopf, I don't know exactly how to say that name, but ETH Zurich and Max Planck Institute. So these are basically academic affiliations, but if we actually look at uh, Audio Diffusion PyTorch, 
it doesn't necessarily seem like they like I wouldn't be surprised if they try to spin this out into a startup here um, so I don't know we'll see what happens because there's definitely money to be made in this kind of with this kind of application of diffusion model so I'll be curious to see if these people just kind of try to spin it off into a startup okay Music generation, more generally audio generation, has multiple aspects at different levels of abstraction that make it a challenging problem. Okay. Existing audio generation models explore the use of recursive neural networks. Yeah, this is kind of very old school. Uh, adversarial generative networks, so GANs, RNNs, uh, I would say autoencoders are still somewhat used, right? Uh, especially if you have transformers as part of that. But RNNs, GANs, and autoencoders are definitely like the previous generation of deep learning. Now it's all transformer based. Several long standing challenges modeling the long term structure, improving the sound quality, increasing the diversity of the generated music, and enabling easier control of the generation. Yeah, there is a group that has done this before. I remember when I was at Google, uh, there was a team, I think it's called Magenta. Yeah. So there was uh, a whole team that basically was uh, a bunch of very, very talented machine learning people, researchers, engineers, and so on, who uh, basically all their work was always related to music and music generation and MIDI files and uh, this stuff was really cool. So this is a completely separate team, completely separate research group, but uh, there have been people kind of going in the music generation for a long time. Um, yeah, these guys had all kinds of cool demos. Usually they, it seemed like kind of from my recollection, they always kind of did stuff in MIDI files. If you guys know, MIDI files are uh, kind of like this. So, it's basically where you discretize the space into basically the individual keys of a piano. So like, rather than generating a continuous audio wave, you're basically generating one of whatever, a hundred different piano keys. It discretizes the action space of music. So that's kind of, it seemed like the way that most people were doing audio generation, but it seems like these guys here in this paper, the way that they're doing it might actually be more so just directly they're generating the raw audio wave but I'm not a hundred percent sure so we're, we're gonna have to wait to see um, let's see here two-stage generation architecture in the inference mode for our model specifically we encode text with pre-trained frozen language model into a text embedding okay so we first encode the text into a text embedding so they're taking the text and then basically tokenizing it uh, and putting it through a big word transformer, probably BERT, if I had to guess, but we'll see later on. So now you have basically a nice little set of vectors uh, that represent this text here. So Egyptian, dark kuba, drums, rhythm, two of four, blah, blah, blah. And then they have here diffusion generator, and then they have a diffusion decoder. So they have kind of an encoder decoder situation going on. We generate a compressed latent Hello, Dr. Prince. Hello. Uh, the compressed latent is turned in, used to condition the diffusion decoder to generate the final waveform. Okay, so this is actually the interesting part. It seems like they're generating the waveform directly, so yeah, basically you have an encoder which takes the text uh, takes some noise, right, just like generic noise, and then over time removes uh, audio, or removes noise from this noisy latent and produces a kind of clean latent vector. This clean latent vector is then used to basically condition a decoder, which also starts with noise, but it's basically starting with noise in the shape and form of an actual audio waveform, and then it, uh, rem it iteratively removes the noise from this audio waveform here right, as diffusion models do, and ultimately you get the actual audio waveform. So there's a couple different steps here. You're basically going from text into a text embedding. Then you're going from a uh, text embedding, you're using that to condition a diffusion model, which slowly 
turns a noisy latent into a actual latent. And then you're using that actual latent to condition a separate diffusion model, which goes from a noisy audio and then step by step by step into a actual final audio. So this is a pretty good little summary of the uh, system here. And again, you got one big, just generic pre-trained text encoder. You got a diffusion model here, and then you got a separate diffusion model here. Okay, from the landscape of existing music, music generation, we can see that challenges exist, uh, can only generate a few seconds of audio, and uh, require long inference time. Yeah, those are kind of the demos that I remember seeing is they, they wouldn't be real time for sure. But those demos were a little bit a while ago, so I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore. Okay, our Moose AI model uses a custom two-stage cascading diffusion method. So I think the two-stage refers to the fact that uh, there is this, uh, let's actually do this so you guys can, we can see the picture better. Right, it refers to the fact that there's two different diffusion models here. You have the diffusion generator and the diffusion decoder. Uh, and then I think the cascading refers to the fact that this first one here uh, is basically just performing diffusion in the latent space, right? So it's removing noise in the latent space, and then you have a second model here that is using that uh, latent to uh, condition the removal of noise in the actual audio space. The first stage, it compresses an audio waveform using a novel diffusion autoencoder, and in the second stage, it learns to generate the reduced latent representations conditioned on the text embedding generated by a pre-trained language model. Both stages use an efficient unit, okay, optimized by us, enabling fast inference speed, which makes it realistic for usage. Conclusion, the main contributions of our work are as follows. Nice little uh, bulleted points here at the end of the introduction that tell you exactly what this paper is going to do. So long context 48 kilohertz stereo music, exceeding the minute mark, so over a minute efficient one-dimensional unit architecture, uh, real-time on a single consumer GPU. Each stage of our system can be trained on one A100 GPU, so unfortunately these are kind of quite expensive, but uh, they're not at the level that like an individual would realistically purchase one, but a small startup, you know, you could definitely have an A100 GPU in-house or you could just rent one from a cloud service, right? You can rent cloud GPUs, A100 GPUs are probably a couple dollars an hour. So if you really wanted to use one, you could. We present a new diffusion magnitude autoencoder that could compress the audio signal 64 times. Okay. Compared to the waveform with moderate quality loss. Okay. So I mean, audio compression is extremely, uh, is a very deep rabbit hole. Like people have been working on the problem of like audio compression, the lossy and non-lossy versions of that for decades and decades and decades. So I doubt that what they're doing is necessarily state of the art there, but it kind of works out for their approach. Okay, we have table one, comparison of the model with previous music generation. We show the comparisons along with audio sample rate. Okay, so this is the sample rate. Um, generally, the lower the sample rate, uh, kind of the, the worse the quality of the audio, but it's also not uh, super uh, noticeable, right? It's like if you, if you have someone who's a professional musician, they're going to 100% going to be able to tell the difference between 48 kilohertz and 16 kilohertz, but like for your average person just listening to something on the internet there, they might not even be able to tell the difference between these sampling frequencies and it makes it significantly more compute heavy to have a higher sampling frequency. So uh, hats off to Musai to, to kind of choose a very aggressive, very high sampling frequency here. Um, and also the at here means how many channels. So single channel means basically mono, you're hearing the same thing on left and right. Double channel 
here means you, you could potentially have two channels. You could potentially have a different thing coming in your left ear and right ear. Uh, context length, so this is basically how much, uh, how big is the basically the, the context that your network can pay attention to, right? What is the receptive field of your model? So for example, the WaveNet in 2016, this is a, a very famous paper. Uh, we might actually ha read that in our historical papers Fridays that I kind of want to start doing. But it really only had a couple seconds of context versus now this Musai has minutes of context. Input text. Okay, so different uh, things that you can condition your generation on. Obviously, the very first versions of this didn't have anything, but now you can condition on just kind of freeform text, music of any genre, uh, and then inference time. Yeah, so some of these like jukebox here takes hours to generate, but compared to this version here, audio length, so you can basically generate it as long as it, however long it takes to make that sound is however long the sound is. Cool, related work. A common trend in generative space has been to first train a representation learning compression or upsampling model in the input domain and then later turn a generative model on top of the reduced representation. This can be drastically more efficient than directly learning on the raw input data. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of largely what they're doing here too, right? Is that uh, they're removing noise in a latent space and then using this latent space to condition the decoder. So there's also something to be said here that that's largely kind of what they're doing here is that they're basically, uh, the fact this latent space, this latent vector here, where they're removing the noise, this is gonna be much lower dimensional than this one here, right? The actual raw size of the raw audio. So we've seen this time and time again with these diffusion models where people will use uh, will remove noise in a latent space in a uh, smaller version of the image and then either upsample in the case of images or here uh, basically use it to condition the actual diffusion model that operates at the true dimensionality of the audio space. Okay, here they talk about autoencoding, quantized autoencoding, right? This is the vector quantized VQVAE, um, where uh, rather than allowing the uh, encoding, right, the vector in that embedding space to be uh, infinite resolution, they basically constrain it to a code book, a limited amount of vectors. Uh, and that's kind of what the quantization means there is that you're quantizing that space into a code book of vectors and it's always going to be one of those vectors. It's kind of like a token, right? It's like uh, the tokens aren't basically a continuous space. There's a, there's a specific amount of tokens. I think for GPT it's like something like 50,000, uh, but for BERT, which I guess is what they use, I don't actually know if it's BERT what they use, but I'm assuming it's BERT. It's like a order of magnitude less than that. Uh, learn quantized representations. Or to learn continuous compressed or deterministic downsampled representations and later apply diffusion models as generators to reconstruct. In our work, we follow ideas from the cascading diffusion approach, which to our best knowledge has never been attempted for audio generation. Yeah, this is like probably definitely the first one I've seen, but diffusion for audio generation is, it's, a, it's an obvious next step. So it was just a matter of time before someone released a paper like this, but these guys were the first to do it. So hats off to them there. Preliminaries. We introduce several preliminaries that serve as the basis for our model. Specifically, we give an overview on the working of diffusion, latent diffusion, and units. Okay, so they're going to kind of describe those three different parts there. I actually always find these sections interesting because, you know, describing diffusion models in four pair in like three paragraphs like this is actually kind of hard. Like, so I'm always curious, uh, kind of what's the uh, Feynman. Right, the famous physicist would say that like if you can't explain something simply, you don't really fully understand it. So the way that people describe things in like these kind of uh, preliminaries or related work sections kind of lets you know 
how well they really understand diffusion models, right? Are they going to give you kind of a generic description or are they going to give you something that really gives you the high level idea of what a diffusion model is doing? Audio generation has long been a challenging task. At the lowest level, we have digital waveforms that control air movement from speakers, right? So audio is basically just a pressure wave through air. And really what your speaker is doing is it's pushing the air. And it's pushing the air at a specific little, uh, at a specific frequency and with a specific amplitude. So that's really the only thing that's going on when you're creating audio. And digital just refers to the fact that the, it's not an analog wave, right? It's like it's been converted into a digital uh, signal. Usually through like things like Fourier series, where basically you, you decompose a, a wave into its kind of component parts. But that type of stuff gets pretty intense pretty quick, so I'm not going to pretend to know uh, a lot about audio uh, digitization and compression and stuff like that. Higher sample rates allow for more temporal resolution and can represent higher frequencies, but at the same time it is computationally more demanding. Yeah, so higher levels of abstraction, we find qualitative properties such as texture, timber, or pitch. Zooming out, we observe structures such as rhythm and melody, and then uh, you have minutes of interconnected patterns. Yeah, so there's different levels of, of abstraction with sound, right? You have everything from the like kind of micro level, things that are happening at like one tenth of a second. You have rhythm and melody that are happening multiple seconds, and then you have kind of patterns that are happening at the span at the span of a minute. So there's a lot of different resolutions of time. Uh, if you want to be able to generate audio that's good. Audio can be represented as a single waveform, mono, or two waveform stereo, or even more in the case of surround sound. Audio with two or more channels can give a sense of movement and spatialization. From the modeling perspective, there are unconditional models that generate novel samples from the training distribution without any additional information, or conditional models that use a form of guidance, yeah, such as text which is what they're doing here. Okay, so we employ V-objective diffusion as opposed, as proposed by Salamans and Ho. Given a sample X naught from a distribution P of X naught, some noise schedule, zero to one, so here, we're gonna do this. So, the sample x naught is this, right? You just start off with a sample from a distribution. It's this little gray thing here called noise. Uh, a noise schedule, so there's some noise that's being basically added and then you're removing that noise. So the, the noise is here and then you remove the noise. Uh, this is the uh, variance standard or the standard deviation of the noise. And some noisy data point x sigma t uh, beta naught so there's alphas and betas here that kind of modulate how much noise you're adding to the data point so here you have a a data point or you could think of it just basically like a vector of just numbers and then you're adding basically Gaussian noise to it to get the, the that same little vector or that same little audio piece but just now with more noise and then you're trying to make a model, right? An actual diffusion model here. This is the actual model that takes the noise schedule. So it knows kind of the rough parameters of the noise and it also knows the uh, noisy data point. And then you want it to basically tell you what the noise that you added was so that you can then remove that noise. Uh, T here is basically the the steps. So diffusion models, they don't remove the noise all at once. They basically do it iteratively in a number of steps. So here we have one, two, three steps, uh, but they actually have like a little dot, dot, dot here, right? So you see that there's actually probably way more steps. Uh, we've seen papers where they have diffusion models that remove everything in one step, but I would say most are doing something like 10 steps and then you have like people that have thousands of steps. If I had to guess, maybe around 20 steps, something like that, but uh, I don't know, they'll tell us at some point. Okay. 
here they're just kind of defining different things here. So alpha and uh, beta are actually the same uh, thing. They're both just uh, the sine and the cosine of this phi here. And the phi is actually a function of the noise schedule as well. So these hyperparameters here, alpha, beta, all just basically boil down to the same hyperparameter, which is the noise schedule, right? And what does the schedule mean here? So much like when you train a network, you have some kind of learning rate schedule where you change the learning rate over the course of the training period. You're doing a similar thing here with the noise where at the beginning of the uh, training pipeline, you're gonna have a different amount of noise, right? A different schedule of noise than here at the end. So that's basically what the schedule means is that you're adding different amounts of noise depending on how uh, far along this uh, training pipeline you are, right? How far along this time T here you are. Okay, ODE samplers can be used to turn noise into a new data point. In this work, we use the DDIM sampler. So this is basically just what is, uh, how is the noise added, right? How do you sample the distribution to add noise? This, there's like a, there's a paper that we read that was very mathy, uh, specifically around kind of what samplers to choose for these diffusion models. And that was a rabbit hole we went down, but I don't really recall exactly why this one is better than the other ones, but it doesn't really necessarily matter. Uh, we just know that they're using this sampler. The DDI sampler denoises the signal by repeated application of the following. So this is actually what the, the sampler is doing or denoising, how it denoises. So this is your actual diffusion model here, this F sub theta. Um, this is your noisy input. And then this is the, uh, out, the output at the previous step. So basically, ultimately what you wanna do is you want to figure out what, this, what the next step is, right? So you have here, this would be X of sigma t and then this would be x of sigma t minus one so basically all you're doing you're all your little uh diffusion model which is basically this unit what it's really doing is it's going from here to here and you're just conditioning it on this text embedding uh, for some t step noise schedule yeah so again this uh t in zero to one right the the time is discretized, right? So there's a there's a specific amount of steps that you're taking here. Following the work on image diffusion, we compress audio into a smaller representation and apply the diffusion to, on a reduced latent space. Yeah, so this is just a great way to uh, reduce the total computation. Unit architecture used for both di diffusion decoder and latent diffusion generator. The inner dash region indicates that the unit block can be recursively nested, ResNet items. Okay, so R means ResNet, and then modulation items M are used to provide the diffusion noise level feature vector conditioning. And then external channels as conditioning. Attention items are used to share information time-wise and cross attention items are used to condition on an external text embedding. Okay, so there's a couple different symbols that they introduced here. They introduced the purple or the orange circle. The orange circle means uh, text embedding, right? Which is uh, this, it's basically the your text converted into a little embedding with a text pre-trained text encoder, something like BERT. Um, you have the external channels, uh, this purple here, or pink, I guess. So that's probably just uh, kind of like how they were saying that you have uh, multiple channels, right? You have left and right, single waveform, two waveform, like, so that's probably what that is. It's basically they condition on the left or they condition on the right. Feature vector conditioning, this kind of yellower thing here. Um, we don't really know what that is. I'm, I'm guessing it's probably just uh, maybe the type of music or like some kind of like extra information that you're passing in in the form of a feature vector. I think they'll probably describe it later. 
and okay that's basically the key parts of the stuff that's at least the stuff that's being used to condition this unit but then you have a variety of of bricks here a variety of neural network modules here you have a resnet residual connection right network with residual connection you have modulation you have what is i they don't tell you what i is oh inject items i okay so probably just a, a addition like a concatenation then another attention and then a cross attention okay so it's kind of a little convoluted and you have basically this represents one uh, brick within the the unit and then you have multiple of these bricks right so they're zooming in here on just one of these items but you would have basically three of these in a row um, and then you also have basically down sampling and up sampling and then you have here a skip connection so this arrow here is basically giving a path for the gradient so whenever you actually train this you're going to be pushing gradients right and if you were pushing gradients and you didn't have this skip connection here what would happen is that by the time the gradients get to here they would basically be nothing right they would just they have to like go through all this sludge and they would have no momentum left right there'd be basically nothing left to really it's a vanishing gradient problem so by adding this skip connection here you're allowing the gradients basically to flow over to this part of the network here with a full strength so that's the the point of having that skip connection there all right unit what do they have to say about the unit the units were first proposed in 2015 as an hourglass convolution only 2d architecture with skip connections um, a rich since repurposed for multiple uses such as image audio and video generation our proposed unit has little resemblance to the original work and is infused with multiple new components such as more modern convolutional blocks a variety of attention blocks conditioning blocks skip connections maintaining only a skeleton of the hourglass architecture yeah so something to be said here right unit you like sometimes it refers to the actual specific unit that's that that uh, was proposed here in 2015 but it kind of nowadays when people say unit it's usually not that specific architecture it's just kind of this idea of having something that is kind of higher dimensional and wider and then compresses down into like a uh, uh, less lower dimensional and then goes back up to a higher dimensional so it's like that high low high that's really the core kind of concept of the unit and now anytime people do that kind of like high low high they basically refer to it as a unit even though it really doesn't have to do anything with this like medical image segmentation paper in 2015. All right, let me take a big sip here. Muzai is composed of two independently trained models. The first stage is responsible for compressing the audio waveform 64 times. In the second stage, we generate a novel latent space by the diffusion model while conditioning on text embeddings. Yeah. So this is the uh, part here. This is the novel latent space that they're generating. We use a 1D unit employed in different configurations. Units with 1D convolutional kernels are more efficient compared to 2D in terms of speed. Uh, can be used on both waveforms or on spectrograms. So spectrograms are image are basically this. It's uh, basically taking a waveform and converting it into an image, right? Where each basically uh, row in this image uh, corresponds to a specific frequency, right? So basically, you're you're breaking down an audio signal into its component frequencies with some kind of Fourier transform, and then saying, okay this is the the magnitude of the coefficient on this particular uh, frequency for a, uh, a Fourier transform right um, Fourier, tran Fourier transform uh, spectrograph like there has to be a cool gift for this right yeah I think this is kind of the coolest one so you have your actual raw audio here right and then it gets Converted through a Fourier transform into basically uh, these two parts. So basically, what the Fourier transform has told you is that your original audio is actually composed of these two 
uh, uh, waves here, right? These two sine waves or cosine waves. And uh, how much of each? Well, a little bit of this wave and then a lot of this wave. And then your spectrograph is basically telling you, this is what a spectrograph looks like. It's saying for each frequency from zero to whatever this is, 10,000 hertz, right? How much of each wave is there in the audio? And you can see here that, okay, here, at one second into the audio clip, there's a lot of kind of high free or low frequency stuff, and then just kind of some occasional high frequency stuff. Um, but these kind of spectrographs are a lot easier to parse than audio uh, raw audio waves. And not only that, but you can actually almost read them as a human. So you can actually look at a spectrograph as a human and kind of have some idea of like what's going on versus like if you just look at a raw audio wave, it's like almost impossible to know what's going on. So audio wave or spectrograms are pretty popular in kind of the audio space. Use a variety of repeated items. At, okay, residual one. Eject an item that concatenates. Yeah, so this is the what we were saying. It's a concatenation. Concatenates external channels. Attention item used to share long and then cross attention item used to condition on text embeddings. Okay, so they're just kind of further describing their uh, little uh, unit architecture that they designed there. Diffusion magnitude autoencoder, DMAE training scheme. The diffusion autoencoder stage learns to compress audio 64 times into a smaller latent space. And this is key, right? It's like doing everything in the raw audio space, like this here, this decoder, this is a lot of compute, a lot of memory. This this noise, this vector here, it only looks like it's slightly bigger than this here, but it's actually way bigger, right? The What they're telling you is that the difference between this vector here and this vector here is 64 times. So this vector here is 64 times bigger than this vector here. So it's a lot faster to remove the noise from this tiny little vector here, this latent vector, than it is to remove the noise from this giant 64 times bigger uh, actual audio uh, vector. So it's really all about this uh, idea here of basically compressing the audio and then doing everything in that smaller latent space. Waveform is converted to a spectrogram and then auto-encoded into a latent space. The original audio is corrupted with a random amount of noise and then the unit is trained to remove that noise. Yeah, so this is basically just Diffusion Models 101 here. The unit is conditioned on the noise level and the compressed latent, which can have access to a reduced version of the non-lossy audio, right? So you can condition diffusion models on a uh, anything that you want. So here they're, compre they're conditioning on the uh, text and then a feature vector. And then the second part, their decoder, they're conditioning it on that latent. Okay, so this is the text version of the description that we just read here. Diffusion can act as a powerful generative decoder, and hence the input can be reduced to latents with higher compression ratios. In this work, we propose a new diffusion autoencoder that first encodes a magnitude spectrogram into a compressed representation, and then later injects the latent into intermediate channels. Okay. So here they're kind of describing exactly what they're doing. Let W be a waveform. So you have a waveform of shape C and T, right, for C channel, so it's gonna be two channels and T time steps. Uh, if they have one second of audio at a 48,000 uh, freq sampling frequency, this is gonna be 48,000, so this is the shape of the waveform is gonna be two channels by 48,000 for one second of 48,000 uh, sampled audio. Um, MWPW is basically the, here's the Fourier transform, uh, and you're giving it the waveform. So the Fourier transform, you have to specify basically the uh, binning of time, which is N, and then the, uh, one of these is time, and then one of these is the channel. So if we actually go here, right, the M is basically the discretization of this axis, and then the H is the discretization of this axis. It might be the other way around. It might be 
n is the uh, the y and h is the x, but that's basically what you're doing here is you're basically defining the resolution of your uh, spectrograph. Hello, M9. Hello. Um, okay, window size of 1024. Okay, so this is the actual window that gets uh, moved around, which determines the time, and then hop length of 256. The resulting spectrogram will have shape C times N and then T over H. Yeah, so this is the key part here is that your time steps, which used to be right 48,000, are now being reduced drastically because you're dividing by that 256. So the, the dimensionality of the uh, spectrogram is significantly smaller than the dimensionality of this uh, raw waveform. We discard phase and encode the magnitude into a latent Z. Okay. Using a 1D convolutional encoder. Okay, so they're basically just taking this uh, spectrograph and then just encoding it into a little vector here, this pink thing. The original waveform is then reconstructed by decoding the latent using a diffusion model. W hat, which takes in Z, uh, sigma, and S, where decoder, theta decoder is the diffusion sampling process with starting noise, epsilon, sigma, and S is the number of decoding sampling steps. Okay, so S is basically this here that we saw, right? It's how many T's how many noises you or how many steps you have in your t-step noise schedule so they still haven't told us what that is my current guess is something like 10 but it might even be a thousand so the decoder is trained with v objective diffusion while conditioning on the latent yeah so key here it's conditioned on the latent where f theta decoder is the proposed 1D unit called repeatedly during decoding and this is why a lot of diffusion models uh, are not uh, real time when it comes to uh, inference is because you have to apply them many times right however many steps you have you have to apply that that many times so to go from noise into an image or in this case noise into a actual usable audio transform you have to do inference s amount of times right so that that can actually take some time Since only the magnitude is used and phase is discarded, the diffusion autoencoder is simultaneously a compressing autoencoder and vocoder. Higher compression ratios can be obtained than autoencoding directly on the waveform, yeah. So the spectrograph here is really about just reducing the dimensionality of the input. Discarding phase is beneficial. Diffusion model can easily learn to generate a waveform with realistic phase, even if conditioned only on an encoded magnitude. Depending on the desired speed quality, more or less compression can be applied in the first stage. 64x compression is a good balance. The latent space produced is then used as a starting point for the next diffusion stage. To make sure that the reproduced latent space can be used for diffusion, we apply a tan H function on the bottleneck keeping the values in the range of negative one to one. Okay, so that's uh, interesting. So this uh, latent vector here, right, this pink latent vector, which ultimately is used to condition the decoder, they apply a tan H at the very last layer because they want that, uh, that latent vector to be kind of uh, reduced to negative one to one or normalized or whatever you want to call it shaped to negative one to one I think shaped is probably the better term normalizing is is like a specific definition but yeah so whenever you take your input and put it through a sigmoid or a tan H or something like that you're basically you just want it to be in a specific range and nicely shaped 
All right, so that's the first stage here that goes basically from your uh, text encoding or text embedding into a uh, latent vector here. Right, so that's a, basically a little diffusion model. And then here you have a second little diffusion model that actually is going to go from the latent vector into an actual uh, audio waveform. Yeah, the second stage applies latent diffusion on the previously obtained compressed space. Similar, similarly to the previous stage, we use V-objective diffusion with their 1D unit. So it's actually the same unit, but just a slightly different architecture, right? Um, conditioning on the text embedding E to generate the compressed latent. Or no, maybe this is actually the, never mind, this might be the second part. Same sampling to approximate the z-hat from the text embedding and starting noise. Text embedding, starting noise. The final generation stack used for inference to obtain the waveform is, okay, so here you have noise. Here you have the number of steps for the uh, first diffusion model. Here you have the text embedding. And then this is the first diffusion model here. Right, the encoder, this thing here, the fusion, they call it the generator, I guess. Yeah, okay, it's, it's generator because it's the one that's actually going from noise into an actual latent that means something, and it's the one that's conditioned on the text. And then the decoder, all it does is it takes that latent that's produced there. It has a different number of steps. It has a uh, different noise schedule and starting noise, and then it produces uh, W hat, which is the actual final waveform that you want. Uh, the 1D unit uses includes cross attention blocks to provide the conditioning text embedding and multiple attention blocks to make sure information can be shared over the entire latent crucial to learn long range audio structure to obtain the text embedding prior work on text conditioning suggests either learning a joint data text representation or using embeddings from a pre-trained language model Okay, so here it is. It's not BERT, it's a pre-trained and frozen T5 model. Okay, our guess was wrong, it's not BERT. Example text prompts. So these are the prompts that they used. I don't know what this two of six is, like what, what the fuck is that? These guys are not good at prompting. This is like a weird prompt. I feel like they should talk to the stable diffusion people. The people who like have been messing with image generation models, like they're, they're actually quite good at like text and or prompt engineering at this point. So it'd be kind of cool if like, there probably is something out there, but like a kind of a prompt engineering 101, how to do it. Cause there's definitely people who are kind of experts now at that. It's like a new engineering field that just like create was created out of thin air, so kind of cool to think about that. We train all the models on a relatively modest collection that we compiled, so here we go, 25,000 hours of stereo music sampled at 48 kilohertz. The autoencoder is trained on random crops of 5.5 seconds. And the text conditional diffusion generation model is trained on fixed crops of length 44 seconds. Encoded into 32 channels. Okay, so I was 100% wrong there. It's not just two channels, it's 32 channels. Given a song that could span longer, we append a string indicating which chunk is currently being trained off. Ah, uh, okay, that's what that is. The one of four is basically a way of uh, telling the model that this is one of multiple pieces. Shuffle a list of metadata and drop each element. Okay, so they have some basically some dropout on the actual metadata. I 
this is kind of interesting. 50% of the time they concatenate the list with spaces and the other 50% of the time we use commas. So this kind of like heuristic uh, prompt uh, creation is kind of interesting. I've seen this in a couple other places where like uh, they'll, they'll basically use like, you, like a bunch of for loops basically to create and if else statements to create a bunch of different prompts. So it's like a panda, an image of a panda, a panda in an image, a drawing of an image of a panda, right? And it's basically you, you take a single human prompt and then convert it into like 50 prompts that are kind of like all similar. So they're doing something similar here where they're like, sometimes it's with spaces, sometimes it's with commas, they're sometimes dropping out specific words and so on. So like this kind of like data augmentation in the prompt space is kind of something that I'm seeing more and more again, which is interesting. Okay, 185 million parameter diffusion autoencoder. That's not like ginormously big, but that's still like quite significant. Uh, seven nested unots, down sample each time by two. Okay, following repetitions. Channel injection only happens at depth four. Okay, we trained at 854 million text conditional generators, so that's a little bit bigger there. This is starting to get a little bit out of control. Six nested U blocks, right? They're just kind of showing you all the different uh, layers of the UNet and kind of how uh, you go from higher dimensional to lower dimensional. They have some skipping here. Yeah, so I mean, these guys designed this unit from scratch, right? So they're quite proud of the unit that they've designed. So of course, they're going to basically spend a bunch of time here in the paper talking about the unit that they designed. This is also why I think that uh, these people are probably going to uh, make a startup around this, because if you design the architecture from scratch, you can basically decide what the licensing is going to be yourself. You don't need to be beholden to the original architecture creator. So, yeah, this is kind of smelling like they want to make their own startup. Okay, you have a learning rate of 10 to negative four different uh, hyperparameters for the atom optimizer and uh, weight decay, 10 to the negative three. Actually, this is a... Uh, Let's give them this one. Save. Uh, we'll call it error in audio gen. Let's go get credit for this. Issues. New issue, typo in paper. Great work in section, what is this? 5.2, 5.2 of the paper, there is a typo. I think you meant Wait. Not white. And let's see if we can paste that. Yeah, we can paste that. All right, assignees, labels, projects, nothing. Let's just submit it. All right, perfect, and we get credit, guys. That's how you do it, that's how you get credit. Okay, we use limited computational resources available on a university lab. Both models are trained on a single A100. This is still pretty hardcore. One week of training on an A100 GPU with a batch size of 32, like A100 price. Uh, A100 price at uh, for one hour. GPU pricing, here you go. A100. 
An A100 is GPU price, 393, so $3.93. Uh, times 24 hours in a day, $3.93 times 24 hours in a day, times seven days in a week, equals $660. So $660 is the total training cost for this. Still quite expensive, but definitely within the reach of, of a small startup. Uh, for inference, a novel audio source of 88 seconds can be synthesized in less than 88 seconds using a consumer GPU. Results. Our model is the only model that generates long context music from text descriptions. Ooh. The only text to music model comparable with our work is the refusion model. We describe the merits of our model in quantitative and qualitative ways. Music is a complex artifact, not to mention the subjectivity of music perception. I would say the same about images. I think images are also very subject to subjectivity. Um, we design a listener set. We uh, list of 40 text prompts spanning across several common music genres. We generate music with both Muzai and the Refusion model. So they're, this is what they're kind of comparing it to. They're benchmarking it against Refusion, which is a 2022 paper. We observe that our music samples exhibit a good diversity and fit the text descriptions well. All right, I believe you. Each annotator listens to all 80 music samples we provide and is instructed to categorize each sample into exactly one of four provided genres. How many times the corrector perceivably identifies, perceiver correctly identifies the genre? Okay, so they got people sitting in rooms listening to AI generated music. Display the confusion matrix. Okay, so the diagonal here shows you that. Uh, most people identify pop as pop, metal as metal, hip hop as hip hop, electronic as electronic. Metal being the darkest here tells you that most people uh, can identify metal as being metal more so than any other genre. And electronic hip hop had there's some confusion here. So sometimes electronic kind of sounds like pop, electronic kind of sounds like hip hop, or pop kind of sounds like hip hop. But really what they're trying to show you here is that uh, Musai generates music that is much easily, much more easily identifiable as belonging from a genre compared to a uh, refusion, which most people think just generates pop. So electronic, hip hop, metal, all of these are basically being confused as pop music. Visualize figure six, we can see that low frequency sounds are handled rather well by our model. Yeah, so actually this is kind of what I was saying is that these spectrograms, like you can actually kind of see what's going on as a human. You can look at this and have a better idea of, of what this audio is like compared to a raw waveform where you could just look at it and m most of what you can tell is the kind of the amplitude or just the like s amount of sound. But here you can actually say, okay, how much low frequency audio is there? How much high frequency audio is there? The true samples are in the top and then the auto encoded samples are in the bottom. So you actually see how a lot of the, uh, what the auto encoder is largely doing is it's removing a lot of the high frequency stuff. It's basically just doubling down on this low frequency stuff, which is kind of interesting.
It is apparent that our model performs well within drum-like sounds as frequently found in electronic house, dubstep, techno, EDM, and other metal music. Lower amount of information required to represent low frequency sounds. That's interesting. Our generated samples exhibit structure over longer periods of time exceeding the minute mark. Entire courses are found in generated music. Okay, making the model bigger can make the model better. That's pretty obvious. Additional properties. We also explore several properties of our model, namely the trade-off between the speed and the quality, the compression ratio and quality. Trade-off between speed and quality. We find that 10 sampling steps in both stages can be enough to generate. So here we go. Our guess was correct. We guessed it. The number of sampling steps, so basically how many uh, steps they're using here to remove the noise, how many times they're performing inference with this diffusion model is 10. But they also tried 50 to 100 steps, so yeah, they... <laughs> 100 steps is a lot more intense, right? You're doing performing 100 inferences of your diffusion model versus just 10 inferences of your diffusion model. So 100 steps is going to take a lot longer than the 10 steps. Increasing the number of sampling steps in the latent diffusion model will similarly improve the quality, likely due to the more general detailed generated latents. We use the same starting noise. This suggests that using more advanced samplers could be helpful. Yeah, there's 100%. Either the people who wrote this paper or people in a different group will 100% basically take what was done in this paper and then just uh, try a different sampler, and that's enough to do a new paper. So diffusion models, you can just basically reproduce other people's work and then just change one or two things in the architecture, such as the sampler, and then show that you either get slightly better results or you get worse results, but find some specific niche where they're slightly better. Using perceptually weighted loss functions instead of the L2 loss during diffusion could help this trade-off. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, rather than uh, kind of just using a reconstruction loss where you're saying, okay, hey, this is the what the spectrograph, this is what the spectrograph looked like, and this is what the uh, the output of your diffusion model which removed the noise from it looked like rather than kind of treating all parts of that the same there's probably a loss that's a little bit more clever and can say okay actually humans can hear the low frequency stuff better than the high frequency stuff so we should have a weight in front of that low frequency stuff we find that the text audio binding works well with cfg higher than three since the model is trained on metadata such as title album artist genre year and chunk yeah, I think this is the the f this yellow here, this yellow vector that is used to condition both the generator and the decoder. I think that is uh, this here, the metadata that includes things like title, album, artist, genre, year, and chunk. Or maybe not. Maybe this is the actual text. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, so the that stuff is basically this it's the text description which gets tokenized and then becomes this orange vector here find that the chunk based text conditioning is coherent with the description future work increasing the scale of both data and the model can very likely provide drastic quality improvements. Yeah, I mean, this is this is where it's all at. If you have a big data set of images or a big data set of audio, and you want to have a successful startup, you can 100% take this paper, which is MIT licensed. Just take this code, train it on your big proprietary data set, and you might. That's a that's a really good way to uh, do a startup. Using a larger pre-trained language model to obtain a text embedding has shown to be very important. Yeah, so another thing you could do is here, this uh, text encoder here, right? This the little icicle sign here means that it's frozen. They're not pushing any gradients into this text encoder here. It's just some generic text encoder they found on Hugging Face, probably. Um, 
use the biggest one you can. So if you took, if you used a little small BERT and you use a much bigger BERT, it's gonna be better. If you use a uh, giant GPT-4, it's gonna be the best. So uh, most diffusion models have found this as well, where using the larger pre-trained language model gives you a much better uh, text embedding, which ends up resulting in better stuff. Sophisticated diffusion samplers, right? So you can pick a different sampler. Okay, the model. Uh, perceptual losses on waveforms instead of L2, so kind of a more clever loss. Proving the quality of diffusion autoencoder by using MEL spectrograms instead of magnitude spectrograms as inputs. That seems like kind of low hanging fruit. I don't know how much more you're gonna gain from that. MEL spectrograms are a type of spectrogram where it's the MEL frequencies. I think it's like human specific frequencies, MEL spectrogram. So, Yeah, MEL frequency. Yeah, so the difference between whatever spectrogram and the MEL spectrogram is that the frequency bands are equally spaced on the MEL scale, which approximates the human auditory system's response to more closely than the linearly spaced frequency bands used in the normal spectrum. So. That's basically what they're saying here is that, hey, rather than just kind of using the generic one that we used, if you use this MEL spectrogram, it might actually be a little bit more, uh, it might be better for human specific generation, right? So these two things here, the, the loss and then the MEL spectrograms are basically just using a prior that's a little bit more human specific rather than just kind of generic. All right, conclusion. In this work, we presented Moose AI, a waveform-based audio generation method building on two diffusion models. First, we trained a diffusion autoencoder to compress a magnitude-only spectrogram 64X. The compressed latent is decoded back to a waveform by diffusion. In the second stage, we trained a diffusion model to generate a new latent from a noise while conditioning on text embeddings extracted from a frozen T5 transformer. We showed that in contrast to earlier approaches, our model can generate minutes of high quality music in real time on a consumer GPU with compelling text audio binding. In addition to trained models, we provide a collection of open source libraries with the hope of facilitating future work in the field. So yeah, I mean, this is a pretty cool little paper. Very impressive stuff. I think it was just a matter of time before someone did uh, diffusion models for audio generation based on text. Um, they have a very awesome looking GitHub. I'm gonna actually save this. I'm probably gonna try to do a stream where we go and we try it out and I'll set it up so that we can actually listen to audio on the stream. But yeah, awesome work. Uh, I have some stuff to do so I'll end it there, but thanks for listening and see you guys tomorrow.